rarely embarrassed, self-conscious, shy, or fearful. How many of you would like to introduce yourself by identifying with this description of the alpha female from 1939? I think that we have all been told that the keys to success are positioned in our relationship with others. I'm going to propose we drop the ball on our relationships and focus inwardly. I don't want to talk about leadership. Data still informs us that women are underrepresented at the top. We struggle to take a seat at the table or push forward the same way men do. A 2019 study from the University of California determined that women need relationships to succeed, a male-oriented one so they can learn to climb the corporate ladder and be mentored in a female one to essentially complain and be understood, or in their words, empathy. The Journal of Experimental Social Psychology supports the idea that seeing women succeed helps others understand how they can achieve success. The funny thing is that I'm not going to continue on a talk about women in the workplace because I think the first step may be valuing life decisions that equate women in the workplace and women in the home, but it is also extended to women that are living outside these two design paths of expectation. There are two things I want to embrace today. One, redefine what an alpha female looks like to you, and two, break the cycle of listening to others to determine your success. Let's talk about what the alpha female has represented and how we as women reimagine a more inclusive and accepting view of strength that has always been there, but was lost in countless attempts to compete with men rather than decline a status quo of individualistic power plays. American psychologist Abraham Maslow, best known for creating a hierarchy of human motivation based on people seeking fulfillment and change through personal growth, articulated that a dominant woman has more self-confidence, higher pose, prefers independence and to be treated like a person and not like a woman. The dominant woman or alpha self identifies as both unconventional and conventional, tending to be more androgynous in their communication style and not always dominant exclusively. So you may think this sounds exactly like you and even prideful that you embody these characteristics. Wait though, why wouldn't we want to be identified and treated like a woman? The truth is at some point society told us that we were weaker and we had less power and we accepted it. The view of alpha style leadership became a masculine example of Western cultural ideas focused on direct communication, analytical and aggressive. In 1998, the Stanford Research Institute presented the concept of an alpha leader as an inherently male concept and only occupied by men. The same research revealed that women, in fact, were scoring better at being men than men. In traditionally male-dominated fields of engineering and business, women were testing higher at presenting in alpha mode. Was this the best way for women to succeed, conforming to a Western cultural derivative of male concepts of leadership? During the late 1990s and early 2000s, the term alpha woman and alpha female spiked in use in popular articles and books and in research and fields of psychology, sexuality, as well as leadership. The rise of interest in alpha females questioned her existence, interesting enough since we had already documented success in male-dominated space, confirmed examples of existence, the continued fight to be seen as alpha, and described her as a one-off, difficult to categorize. Lastly, as an anomaly, not in any way normal or persistent because there just aren't enough representations and these representations were not without complication. By 2006, a study of Western women succeeding in socialization and academics focused on the gains made by women who identified as alpha, such as the right to vote, to make reproductive choices, and to participate in athletic sports previously not accessible to them. What was most noteworthy in the results was that alpha and non-alpha girls were similar. We weren't subscribing to the idea that in order to be successful, we had to break into the boys club. Instead, we could see from the study that the strengths of female leadership were independently our own strengths of maternity, our abilities to be patient, empathetic, strong, and supportive. In 2009, a health psychologist and her colleague were the first to conduct research on the alpha female identity. The results of their study revealed that alpha females come from a nurturing family environment and had role models who taught them that being female was either a non-issue or an advantage. So this then determines a very different approach to acceptance of womanhood as a strength. We were so close, so what happened? We had graduated from step one, 
redefine what an alpha female looks like to you. Unfortunately, the media proceeded to present an alpha as unachievable. We were met with a myth that our happiness was embedded in struggle. The Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media presented research on the demographics and behaviors on primetime television. The stereotyping of women presented a gendered view of women that was negative, casting women as losers in their own stories. Positive traits such as being affectionate, nurturing, kind, and gentle are significantly more often attributed to women, but alongside corresponding stereotypes of dependence, rule following, and passivity. Additionally, femininity carries with it many other negative stereotypes, such as gullibility, irrationality, inferiority, emotionality, indecisiveness, weakness, and uncertainty. This alignment presents women as the weaker sex. The more independent the female character, the more they are likely to end up with challenges in their love lives and struggling to manage their homes while working professionally. Television programs portrayed female characters in interpersonal roles revolving around romance, family, and friends. Programs designated females by marital status and not by profession. This representation continues to perpetuate male hegemony through stereotyping. Research that reinforces this identification, creating expectations and beliefs about gender that are reflected in children's attitudes. So while we see women in positions of power performing better than men in 2009, Gender marking women in television focused on interpersonal relationships over profession, discouraging women from entering male-dominated occupations. The inherent message seems to be that women should focus on marital success and family over work to be happy, the old adage that you can't do both or have it all. I think this is entirely where we lost sight of our intention to be alpha females or strong women. Several psychological studies show in general women tend to attribute their success to good luck or external values, while men attribute theirs to skill. Women need to reclaim our sense of self and stop letting others tell us what we should do to be successful and how we should play a game that has no rules. We traded an idea of success that is antiquated in living according to rules that do not support us but hinder our ability to listen, nurture, and accept. So number two. Break the cycle of listening to others to determine your success. Let's look at the conversations we engage in that I think are inauthentic to success once we become these representations of strong professional women. We listen to others tell us that in order to be successful, we need to conform to an idea of success measured in what has been done before us. My story is one that has been shaped in independence. I lost my father long before I received a college degree and I had no support financially as an adult. In a departmental meeting, a colleague offered her opinion that working in fast food or retail is beneath anyone that wants to have a professional career in education. That our students should not be working at these jobs but pursuing paid internships. I'm not discounting my peers' experiences and desires to better our students' futures, but they fall flat when we think about why hard work and labor is ever undervalued. I worked at Fazoli's, Subway, Universities, JCPenney, Carson's, formerly Elder Bierman. I worked in telemarketing and in the service industry. What those jobs that are beneath some of my colleagues provided me were a living to pursue my college degree on my own. If you have to work to accomplish more, there is no shame in working a job that serves everyone else in society. Funny that it took a pandemic for us to realize how essential these people are. Ask yourself if you really ever thought and realized the definition and application of that word as it applies to those that you need daily to live comfortably. We can encourage networking and connections to make life easier and opportunities more available, but the truth is not everyone has the time or support to build those connections because their feet are already on the ground and life is moving around them. I've sat through a meeting where the more esteemed faculty have encouraged an initiative to encourage our students to have a passport. I have often felt inferior in groups of colleagues because they are not sensitive and maybe tone deaf when it comes to recognizing that being here, a college graduate, an educator, a woman, has somehow propelled us into a position of privilege. The majority of faculty, adjunct faculty, straggle, struggle to work at more than one institution to make ends meet. They teach more courses and interact with more students on a daily basis. They are responsible for carrying the institutional load with very little recognition. When confronted with those that are determined to be our mentors, our fashion of how we can achieve success, kindness is important. 
culture and knowledge is learned through travel, and the advantages of reverie are equivalent in your ability to demonstrate your miles flown. I am 41 and I don't have a passport. In the next 10 years, I see myself being able to travel for the first time. To believe that you are only as intelligent or capable as your experiences abroad diminishes the culture in your own backyard. You can learn from your community about culture. You can learn a foreign language through an application on your phone. You can become knowledgeable through documentaries and reality television. The idea that an experience has value is not lost on me, but to measure someone's worth by their experience casts a lot of remarkable people in the dark. The problem is I put myself in the dark. I doubted my strengths and I felt inferior to those I shared the table with. The truth is that it's okay. It is my strength that I have my own experiences and I think they help me relate and understand people better. I think that I am able to always step back and observe and accept perspectives that are not shared, not aligned with my own. The truth is I backed myself. A college education doesn't make you more worthy of attention. A title doesn't make you more valuable. How you love yourself and others and what motivates you to pursue your passion is what makes you a strong woman. Let's think about Robert Frost in The Road Not Taken. In his poem, we are reminded that we are perhaps better taking the road less traveled. I would like to present that there are three roads we will find ourselves on. The first road is the one that offers us regret and disappointment. That is the road of, a, that is the road of all of our what ifs. What if I had made that choice back there? What wondering my life, my road, might look like now. So many women live in a perpetual state of questioning how they got to where they are and what they missed out on. The constant check of what could have been has no benefit in making you feel better about yourself by relishing in this fear you made a mistake. The second road is the path you're on. We're told that the path to happiness is acceptance of ourselves. Um, counting our reasons to be thankful and looking for our moments. The road is full of acceptance, but it can also leave you lost in the woods, traversing the same pathway over and over again. The road less traveled is the idea that you don't need to wait for a bend in the road or a divergent path. You can forge your own. You can do what no one before you has done. You can strive to be the first to individualize your strengths and achievements. Embody your own stories and care 90% about how you see yourself and 10% how others see you. Your happiness is not rooted in what others think makes someone worthy. It is up to you to maintain the core of your strength and see the values in your life. If we let society construct our roles, we fall to acknowledge everyone as strong alpha women. We can embrace our softness and build future women that meet every intention of self-worth. Stop today negating your softness. Those feminine characteristics make us strong.